But it seemed like... One of the major reasons why alcohol dependence is running in families is because people inherit genes that impact on how their brains function. We found that a low response to alcohol is associated with a high risk for alcoholism regardless of your family history. But if you have both, a family history of alcoholism and a low response to alcohol, your risk is really quite large. Either three out of four or all four of my grandparents were alcoholics, which increases the probability of being an alcoholic. And like, it was just pretty much people who looked at me, even when, from when I was little, could, would tell me, you know, you're gonna be an alcoholic when you start drinking. But once teenagers become hooked by alcohol and drugs, why can't they stop? How do drugs change the brain to make recovery so difficult for many and impossible for others? Edward Coleman began using marijuana when he was 13 and quickly advanced to abusing other drugs. By 19, he was a hardened cocaine addict living on the edge hustling and scamming to feed his all-consuming habit. I can remember days, can't go to sleep from thinking about trying to get high. What can I do or where can I go or who can I rob to get money just to get high? Mm -hmm. So we just have to get your position in the right way so that we can comfortably get up on the table here. Dr. Anna Rose Childress has been studying drug addiction for over two decades. You're going to see some videos, and they could be nature videos or scary or sexy or drug-related. Researchers have long observed that recovering addicts relapse most often when they return to their drug-using neighborhoods and friends. Childress wondered if it was these cues that somehow triggered an insatiable need for drugs in a brain changed by addiction. Just the reminder of drug use, just seeing these friends, seeing a crack pipe, smelling the smell, creates this overwhelming sense of need, of craving, that the world is completely out of balance till I have some cocaine. Childress devised a simple experiment. She scanned the brains of long-term cocaine addicts, but only after they'd been drug-free for two weeks. This would ensure that the images she captured were not cocaine's high, but more permanent changes to the brain. She showed her subjects a series of video images. First, nature scenes. Then, images of explicit drug use. The two different videos produced very different activity in the addicts' brains. The scans during the nature video revealed very little brain activity. But when the videotape switched to drug use, the scans erupted in red, indicating intense brain activity. We could see that the brain was doing something special and something different when a person was in state of desire than when they weren't. It was extremely exciting for us because it was the first time really in all of human history that we'd been able to peek inside the brain during desire. And these are images that were done in the PET scanner that showed... Childress had captured an image of how the brain had been fundamentally altered to produce a driving hunger for cocaine. Well, our patients describe craving as the thing that can push them to do things that they never imagined that they would do, to cross their own rules their own values to put their, not only their relationships in jeopardy, or their possessions, or their jobs, but their very lives. It's like being a victim of a vicious pit bull attack. Once the dog attacks you and locks onto you, he's not letting go. The only way to get him off is to kill him, and that's pretty much how I was looking at it. The only way to get out of drug addiction was to die. Despite the craving carved into his brain, Coleman was able to beat his addiction. And he did it in a way that has intrigued researchers. 
Coleman's legs were a casualty of a stray bullet in his drug-filled neighborhood. But this tragedy allowed him to make a surprising discovery. He was still using cocaine, but to calm his paralyzed but trembling legs, he began taking the common muscle relaxant, baclofen. When he ran out of cocaine, he was surprised to find he no longer needed it. As long as I was taking the baclofen, it was blocking my mind from thinking that I needed the drugs. It was blocking that part of me that thought about it and wanted it. The baclofen appeared to be overriding the craving for cocaine etched into his brain. When Coleman reported his observations to Childress, she was intrigued by this homegrown scientific experiment. So we offered him a PET scan in our usual hummingbird video, cocaine video, with the bet that on baclofen, that we wouldn't see the hot spots lighting up in these areas that are important for anticipating reward. Sure enough, look, there are no hot spots. So for you watching the nature video, your brain didn't respond very much differently when you're watching the cocaine video. His two scans are identical. So the way that he looks at the nature video, the way he looks during the cocaine video, there are no hot spots. So it's really encouraging to us that his description of how he feels, that he doesn't feel pulled and that he feels as though everything's in a manageable range, really matches up with his brain. His brain agrees. Baclofen may prove to be the first medication to actually curb the insatiable desire for cocaine. And it is now in early testing on addicts. But until medications are available to fight addiction, addicts will continue to struggle to overcome addiction on their own. Jesse and these other teenagers will spend anywhere from between three weeks to three months reclaiming their lives. And they have learned important lessons about how drugs have changed their brains. I'm sitting here and I'm really dwelling on the fact that I'm an addict and I need, I need help and I'm not going to be able to do this by myself and I need to do all the things that they teach me, and, um, and it's really hard. It's really hard. It's scary. The disheartening reality is that eight out of ten addicts who leave rehab relapse and return to their addiction, sometimes after months and even years of sobriety. I'm still terrified of, like, relapse and just starting to use again. Um, and that's actually, it's kind of good because I'm less likely to go back out if I am scared to death of it. You don't want it too tight. You just want it so the helmet's not moving around on you. The last hurdle many of these teenagers will face before leaving rehab will be an aerial ropes course. As you notice, there's two cables, one on each side, that suspend the ladder, the rungs, OK? You can't hold on to those. OK. The only thing you can hold on to are those rungs <laughs> and your partner? <laughs> this is not as easy as it looks. Harnesses and that this graduation yeah. exercise symbolizes the challenge these teenagers face in beating their addictions after their brains have been distorted by drugs. A critical part of the brain has literally been hijacked by drugs of abuse. It's been rewired so that behavior is now focused on this life of obtaining and using drugs. Communication is a key. The behavior has become automatic, and the trick for the person who's recovering is to stop these automatic responses. Look above you. What's above you? There you go. What we attempt to do here is recruit other parts of your brain to diminish those improper messages. Woo!